So good morning. So today I'm here with David Seville. Good morning, David. Good morning. So David is a CEO of the CC Group of Companies, which has got some iconic Kiwi brands like um, Crew Cut, uh, Care, was it Crew, Crew Care, Chem Care, CC Training Academy, and CC Facilities Management. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, tell me a little bit about what that what that is and what you do. Well, largely, um, uh, I guess the two. Larger companies that have been going for quite some time, this is Crew Cut and a Crew Care. Yep. Um, one's a national lawnmowing franchise group, yep. and the other is a commercial cleaning franchise group. And then we have a Chem Cares and Asbestos Removal Company. Okay. And uh, and um, environmental cleaning does. Um, and then we have um, CC Training Academy, which trains people in our industry sector um, and in, in construction-related industry se sectors. So um, uh, anything to do with health and safety, mm -hmm. uh, height, short courses usually, uh, certificate level courses, yep. um, and um, your yeah, first aid and various things like that. And then facilities management, it's really just a vertical inside of what we do, um, which um, uh, we take care of the, the maintenance needs of large companies. Fantastic. So when did you first start? It was Crew Cut was the first one, right? So when did that first start? Well, that, that started in 1991. Yep. And, uh, um, yeah, which, you know, is coming up for 30 years. 30 years, yeah, that's yeah. pretty phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And how did it start? Um, actually, I'd been a business owner um, before I was I was 26 and I'd owned my first foray into a business was owning a clothing label yep. and the stock market crash came along and I probably was in my infancy as a, as a business owner and had a really good relationship with my bank manager and in those days the bank manager was all pre-stock market crash would turn up and have lunch with you <laughs> and hand you piles of money and then the stock market crash came and my bank manager stopped taking my calls and <laughs> disappeared and um, I was like, Ma, what's going on? What's changed? And um, uh, giving money was not, uh, was not part of the scheme of things then. And I thought, wow, I'm, go I'm gonna have to, uh, this early stage, I need, I need, need finance. Uh, so I wound that company down, I decided to go mow, mow a few lawns. Okay. And uh, that's how it all started. I, you know, we used to build lawn rounds up and sell them. And I, I went off to Sydney with um, my then wife at the time, and for a, a month or two. And um, um, a friend of mine rang me and said, "Hey, I admire the way you do business. How about we start a business together?" And he made some lawns as well. And. Uh, and he had good access to finance, and um, and then the rest's really history. That's we good. decided to start Kruka. Fantastic. Okay, we'll come back to a bit more about that. But before we get started, I always like to share with our guests a, a personal or professional best from, from you so mm. they can get to understand a little bit better. So if we start with professional best, what would you say your professional best is? I think my professional be best is probably 30 years in, in business. Yeah. 30 years in one brand in business. So And to have a business that... Um, is still growing um, and and profitable um, 30 years on. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Well mm. done. And personally, what's your personal best? I, look, my personal best is is probably growing my family. I, you know, I uh, I've got five kids and um, four grandchildren. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I, you know, I think, yeah, that that would be my, oh, well, and, um, and and and. Now two ex-wives. Two ex-wives. <laughs> and, and a current wife, right? And a current wife. <laughs> so we were talking about this before. I mean, and one of the things you said is you're actually also very good friends with all of your ex-wives and they're an important part of your life. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they've helped my business journey really along yep. the way. And um, while my first wife was, I, I wasn't part of that. My second wife, uh, I was with for 18 years or so. And um, she certainly was significant in helping me along the way of um, getting cracking on with business. Excellent. Mm. Okay. Cool. So tell me, um, what do you love about business? What is it that you enjoy about being a business owner? 
uh, control of my own destiny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, making up my own rules. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I love the learning that goes with it. And, uh, you know, I'm very much a just-in-time uh, style of learner. Yep. So um, when I've got a problem to solve, I'll, uh, I'll do the study. Right. Then, rather than... <laughs> Rather than, <laughs> than do an education course that that I can't apply straight away. Yeah. So, yeah. So what have been the biggest learnings you've had? Because 30 years in business, there must have been a few ups and downs, I'm guessing. Yeah, there has been a few ups and downs. And, um, you know, fortunately, uh, I started in franchising early on, largely because I, you know, I, I actually had someone from Amway come around and, and sell to me. Oh, really? And um, while I didn't want to... Get involved with Amway at the time. The epiphany was they they came into my living room, sat down, and taught me about leverage. Uh-huh. And I looked at this thing of leverage. It's business system. Oh, business system, and you get leverage, and you do that by growing processes and systems, and um, and build something significant forever. And and so that was that was where I came up with the idea of franchising. On the way. There's been lots of um, learnings. One was I thought I'd be rich um, within three years. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> and I, uh, I was, I felt very fortunate that um, you know I could pay myself a salary that I could survive off in the first four years. I think it took me about, you know, we certainly it was about three to four years before I was earning money that would pay the bills right in terms of you know which was quite long you know I think it's pretty normal I would suggest maybe two to three years but yeah still it's a long time to go without having yeah, well I had family at the time so right. I probably need a little bit more money <laughs> 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 so I had, I had uh, certainly one child then yes. and uh, and so you know uh, yeah it's, so it wasn't yeah. an overnight success is that what you're telling it, us it was not an overnight success and because I'm a no, I, I was quite a good, uh, you know, I was quite okay at running long distance. Mm-hmm. And I think that's in my nature too, is to be patient. Right. And to go the distance. And so, you know, I just enjoy running. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think there's some parallels to business. Um, so I was very patient. Yep. Um, back then, I waited for profit. I always paid others before I paid myself. Uh, my franchisees earned more money than I did in the early days, yep. and uh, uh, you know, and I, I was very patient to get dividends. Mm. Yeah. So you said that you know you always had in mind that it would actually become a franchise. Mm. Um, what was sort of the tipping point between it being sort of what you consider successful and still a baby business? <laughs> uh, look, I, I think getting getting. Um, that foundation built, we had the numbers and you had cash flow coming in, uh, significant cash flow coming in every week and um, being able to then build another game on top of that. Um, you know, um, in the early days of business, you're, you're certainly under-resourced and, you know, to be able to hire people and, um, and, and pay them reasonable money yep. um, is, is quite a turning point. I mean, there was always the, the early stages where you're scratching around and trying to induce people to come and work for nothing. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, that's tricky too in an important stage. Yep. But um, yeah, to be able to pay people good money and, um, and grow those, those employee numbers and to not have to do everything yourself. Yeah. We talked about before. So, um, in the early days, you have to do everything yourself, right? You, yeah, you have yeah. to do everything yourself. And while you're not good at everything, you know, I started, you know, as I say, I started with a business partner uh, who exited at about year five. And um, uh, he had some very real skills that I didn't have when he left. You know, it was um, certainly uh, I had to um, be more diligent around those areas. Um, because uh, you know he took care of the numbers. He was um, he was good with numbers. Yep. Yeah. So you had um, complementary skills, I'm guessing. Yeah, I was more sales. Yeah. 
You know, he, we always used to laugh about it. Uh, he called, he was a pessimist. Yeah. I was an optimist, being a salesperson. Yes. And he said, pessimists are realists, David. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, people who can who understand numbers are realists. Yes, you know, and I and I and I, I, I guess I, I become more um, in favour of understanding. You know that that is 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 a very real message. Yeah, but we, when we were talking before, you mentioned that you know um, entrepreneurs we're forward looking, right, rather than backwards looking. So yes. numbers tends to be focused on the the past rather than yeah. the future. Correct. So whilst I agree, you've absolutely got to know your numbers and know what you're measuring and why. Mm. Um, how do you balance that sort of you know the the pessimist with the the optimist, which is really what takes the business forward? Yeah, well, I, I I live in optimism and I live in vision. Yep. And um, I'm forming a future plan all the time. And it's anchored in numbers. Right. You know, and, and I think, because um, I've got family, um, which um, is a hugely important thing for me. Yep. Um, uh, I'm not a, um, a massive risk taker. So, you know, I'm, I'm really um, pinning um, my plans and my thoughts on... Um, on numbers that make sense and um, and growing things, uh, maybe more conservatively than somebody that would uh, um, not necessarily have to consider that legacy piece around children and yeah. and grandchildren and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I know you, your family is really important to you, and you've got a five year old son and a two and a half year old daughter, right? So how do you balance that whole work business life? Um, Look, I, I limit my hours now, and um, and you know, I, I'm often uh, home by three thirty, four o'clock. Um, uh, I work work about six hours, and I, I you know, I, I I commit myself to taking my son skateboarding on a Tuesday, and <laughs> you know, I think uh, you know, through winter it was to snow planet to to, to snowboard. Yep, and. Um, and that's just, it's a priority now. Yeah. In the early days, um, uh, you know, I guess one of my metric is, is how many wives I've had. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, I didn't balance it particularly well. And, and hence, um, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the report card I've got. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's, you know, let's hope we don't make the same mistake and make the same mistake. And so... You know, for me now, um, having a very balanced family and 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 business is an imperative. Yep. Um, and um, I'm very fortunate that I don't have to be compromised in that area. So that means you actually literally have to let go as the owner, right? And let other people get on with running the business. How hard is that? Because I know for a lot of entrepreneurs, that we are control freaks, right? We want to keep control of everything. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know. Uh, one of the one of the epiphanies that I had was um, was uh, being coached by somebody up in uh, Manila one day. Oh. Uh, actually, we're um, um, both been uh, living on the edge of EO, and it was an EO coach entrepreneurs organisation. Yep. And um, and uh, and he coached me about this, and he actually pointed me in the direction of a book called Multipliers, which is, um, uh, was hugely instrumental in me changing my tech with how I manage my people. Uh, because again, you can't grow a business without people. Yep. And that's another point of leverage. And so another metric would be how many key people can I put under me mm -hmm. to, um, to grow my business. And you can't grow them by micromanaging them or giving them the answers. Yeah. Hire good people and ask them questions. Um, and that was one of the messages of the book is um, don't diminish people by giving them the answers um, and grow your people by showing them respect and supporting them to um, use their answers. Yeah. And um, if, if you know you're on track with that, they'll bring you ideas all the time. So they'll be in a meeting and their ideas will float to the top. And um, it, the, I think the hardest thing for an entrepreneur is um, is to not go around an office 
giving everyone the answers. <laughs> yep. Um, and because it just doesn't grow your people. Um, it's disrespectful yep. and, um, and, and futile. Fair enough. Yeah. So that must mean that you have to have trust in the people that you've actually got working for you. So how do you choose those right people for those positions? Well, it's not always easy. Um, um, uh, but, you know, I guess the best advice I ever got on hiring people is hire an attitude and um, train on skills. Yeah. Um, and so I'm always, you know, I guess an amateur psychologist when I, you know, when I hire people. Yeah. And while someone might have the right talent to um, to um, work within my company, they've got to fit the the value system. Yeah. And they've got to have the right attitude, mm -hmm. um, which fits within our culture. And so um, that's really important to. Um, to not hire people on skill set, you know, hire people that actually have a desire to come and work for you. They get it. They want to come and work with you. Yeah, they want to come and work. They want. They want to. They they want to be inspired by you, and they want to come and fit into your group and 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 join your team. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that sort of attitude, um, loyalty, yep. integrity, um, are, they're really important, um, and so. I don't always get it right. No, um, You're human. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, you know, the other thing that I hear a lot of is um, hire slowly, fire quickly. Yep. We don't fire people in New Zealand, but um, <laughs> but get them off the bus quickly. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. And we talked before that you know sometimes actually having the laws that we do have is of benefit because it stops us from making rash decisions or getting bit rid of people. And sometimes people have things going on in their life that they actually can't control, and so uh, being able to work with them to work through that can be helpful. Yeah, look, I I have the the ongoing discussion that we did this morning um, how business owners are frustrated by the labour laws, but. Uh, Actually, I think there's a silver lining in the whole process um, of um, showing respect to anybody that you hire yeah. and going through a, um, a an offboarding process, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't always end up with offboarding. It can end up with redeployment. Yeah. It can end up with um, with firing up and 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 getting people um, again re-enrolled in the business mm -hmm. um, and so the that whole process the outcome is not always off the bus yeah um, so I've grown to like the process frustrated still by the by the timeline sometimes mm -hmm. but um, it is a good process for both parties yeah mm. now we we decided to set this topic as you know don't get lost on a rabbit hole so how to get back to clarity and focus and that was because you were sharing with me last year was a, an interesting year um, entrepreneurs often get sort of you know distracted by bright shiny objects and things they want to do tell me a little bit about your year and what happened with your rabbit hole yeah well COVID it was uh, you know I mean yeah it was for business owners I think we can all agree that it was extremely confusing when we were coming through to the end of March and we didn't know what it was what it would mean for us yeah and um, and so it was extremely confused I felt like I was in a cloud of confusion I was working through a cloud of confusion like into the unknown um, like it was one of those years we were all working into the unknown yep. and I thought I would play offense rather than defense and so I um, hired 10 key staff and- 10 key staff last year? 10 key staff last year and started two businesses. <laughs> yeah. And- um, actually, And new offices. <laughs> new offices. We actually, we actually uh, that was already committed to and they delivered, you know, uh, we did a design job on the new office and they delivered the furniture the night of alert level four to make sure they could enforce this for, <laughs> and we shut the door and went home for a month oh, no. and I hadn't shown shown the office to my staff and offices to my staff and uh, so that was a bit deflating but yeah. um, you know um, yeah so we started new offices it's been it was a great year and then you know in the new offices we'd, we'd have people knocking on our door offering us to sell businesses to us and new deals and 
there was partners coming in that we 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 hadn't um, dealt with before, and we just had a fresh approach. But I completely got distracted by all of that. Right. So I brought it, brought in a very talented friend of mine, um, who's another EO member, actually more talented than I am, <laughs> and uh, a lot more talented than I am, and a lot more a lot more experience than I have, and uh, that's um, Marissa Fong, yep. and uh, to uh, basically tell me what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong, give me some clarity. Yeah. And um, and so that was very useful. Um, How did you recognise you are getting distracted? Because it's very easy to get kind of, as you said, down the rabbit hole and actually even forget that you're down the rabbit hole because you're so engrossed in it. So what was the, the trigger points or the sort of, a, oh, hold on a second, something's going on here? I think there was a feeling of fear when I, you know, I, d- I knew I'd done some things right over the year. Yep. But I wasn't clear on all the things that I m- might be doing wrong. And I really wanted another talented entrepreneur to come in and just throw a, a glance over my business yeah. and tell me how I was going. Uh, also, I was thinking about starting another business yet again. And um, it was in recruitment. Marissa's got a lot of experience in recruitment. And um, and it was a recruitment labour hire, really. Yeah. And, um, and uh and I got some very strong indications from Marissa to uh, to Stick get back to knitting. get back to the knitting <laughs> <laughs> and, and and not go down that rabbit hole called starting an, another business. Although my part of my offensive play was I did actually start two businesses over that year, and she was aware of that. Yeah. So anyway, that was that was really useful. Um, so as I mentioned to you before, in one of my businesses, I left a chunk of change on the table, and um, and that was because I was really kind of distracted. Yep. Mm. Okay. So clarity and focus. What do you? What does that look like? How did it? What does it mean for you? Uh, well, clarity and focus is about commitment. It's about getting committed to solving the problem. Yep. And um, to understanding um, what is the problem you want to solve. Um, and then becoming laser focused around um, around that, yep. and um, and I guess one of the emotions for me late last year, when I looked at one of the things I'd done wrong, um, was a little bit of anger, which <laughs> motivates me. Okay. I got angry, yeah. you know, and um, and I got angry with myself. And um, and that that was kind of like really motivating. Yeah, I was going no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fix that. And it was like, well, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And what are we doing wrong? And why did we end up in this place? Yeah. And um, yeah, it it was it was, it was quite useful. Did you work through that with your key people? Actually, I did, uh, but it was more my personal process. I mean, there was things that we needed to change, and um, you know, we started talking about it before Christmas, and then um, um, bringing in the right people. Mm. And um, as soon as we got back in work, and um, and and we've got some exciting things. Our ne- new financial year is going to be incredible, I think, and. I feel, even though the early numbers look promising, and I feel like we're back on track, um, we've got a, a ways to go before I can really feel like we're we're hitting our stride. Yep. You know, I'd like to see the numbers for mid year. So I asked you um, to sort of you know share a little bit with us about what mistakes you've made and and um, how you, you know, share them with other people to help avoid making the same mistakes. But you also mentioned numbers in one of your top, top tips that we're going to talk about. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I, I don't have a natural talent with numbers, and so you know, again, one of the big breakthroughs for me was four years ago. Um, uh, going, you know what? I need a really strong person on board around numbers. Uh, I understand the bottom line. Yeah. I understand EBITDA. I understand <laughs> money. Yeah. I understand money in my bank account. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I decided to get a CFO because things were starting to get a bit 
uh, complicated and yep. that was a really good hire for me and we've had four very successful years since he's been on board yep. and um, growing the companies exponentially and um, and I've become very reliant on uh, his knowledge and him educating me in areas. You know, um, you know we had a company, uh, ChemCare, which was about hiring um, uh, uh, trade type people with with a particular skill set and asbestos removal. Yeah. And he taught me about uh, labour production ratios, and I was like, that was huge for me, is understanding. Um, uh, labour production ratios yeah. and uh, and its effect on profitability and its effect on profitability <laughs> yeah. uh, and we both know somebody called Tony Falkenstein oh, who, yes. <laughs> in his book he says never hire someone that, that doesn't walk fast yeah. you know and um, you know he used to he tells a story of how he would um, walk behind somebody at an interview yep. to uh, to see and if they walk slowly they didn't get hired <laughs> yep. and in a way, that's a, a, a great metaphor for our uh, labour production ratios and we're hidden profit is. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, so, yeah, we learnt a lot um, uh, through ChemCare's journey because a lot of our profit was in um, poor performing um, staff. Yep. And, um, and, and them using their time inefficiently. Interesting. Okay. Mm. So you mentioned there's a book that you also got, um, that you found that really changed the way you viewed numbers. Yes, yes. Um, look, I, it was written by another EOA, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits by Greg Crabtree. And, um, and uh, it de demystifies for um, people like myself who are a bit challenged. Yep the good numbers to work on. I think one of the things that came out of that was also understanding that if you, once you get to a certain size, you can then start hiring really good people. And I think uh, in that book, uh, you know, it was quite interesting reading it. It was like once you get past the, the I think it was three to five million, um, you know, you, you're really into um, some good growth then. Yeah. Um, you can hire, the you know, some great people and... Um, it's like that number is breaking through a glass ceiling. Mm. And, um, you know, that's exactly what happened to me. I, you know, I was sitting at so much lower numbers than that. And, and then, you know, shortly after, by, by breaking through that three to five million area, yep. my, my business really took off. Fantastic. Okay. Mm. So we'll put a link to that book on the podcast page. We can mm. actually have a look at that. Two other quick things for us um, in terms of top tips for people. We've talked about clarity and focus. What is uh, well, what is I, around I, th that? I actually think that if you're if you're a uh, founder, sole shareholder, um, and um, and you're driving the business, whether it's in a general management role function or yeah. whether it's a CEO role function, that your company is only ever as good as the clarity that you have and the vision that you have. And for that matter, your behaviour. Yeah. So, um, so uh, the lesson for me was knowing just how unclear I was last year, mm -hmm. and um, getting that clarity back felt like I got back on a winning team. Right. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, you cannot point the finger at any of your staff when you haven't got clarity. Yourself. Um, so what do they say, point one finger and two fingers back, back. yourself. Yep. <laughs> and, and it, you know, it's very much um, you are the fault, you are the blame. If the company is not performing up to expectation, um, it all sits with you. And uh, so you've got to go take a look, a good hard look in the mirror <laughs> yeah. and get really committed about that that thing that you're, you're trying to solve sure. and what it is. Perfect. Yeah. And one last thing, um, last top tip for our viewers before we sign off for the day. Uh, look, people management, um, you know, hiring great people and, um, and looking after them and having them being guided by... Um, by the values and purpose of the company, um, you know, and don't tolerate um, 
uh, people that do not live the values of the company and do not bring um, a good game to the um, to the table. You know, hiring people is, is, is both a rich experience and can be quite frustrating because they're imponderable, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, there are times that people go off in weird tangents and, you know, and some of that, if they're not right, if they're not right to be sitting in that seat, then don't have them sit in that seat yeah. um, and get them off the bus or get good people on the bus. You know, we have a lot of, most of our people have stayed with us a long time. Uh, we have a good culture, but occasionally we get it wrong. Yep. So, you know, you can only grow a company if you've got great people and you let them get on and do their job and you've got a great vision. Yeah. So they all come hand in hand, the clarity, the focus, the people, and knowing your numbers yes. are the kind of the key success factors. I think so. That, that, that's certainly for me. Fantastic. Hey, great. Look, we're running out a little bit short of time, so we're going to wrap up there. Um, if people want to get in contact with you, David, how do they find you? Oh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, um, yep. yeah. Yeah, uh, David at CC Group or uh, David at Crew Cut, any of those. David at ChemCare, David yeah. at... Uh, at uh, um, crewcare.co.nz, any of those will find me. Um, yeah, so, uh, in fact, you could probably just about Google me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fairly unique name, isn't it? That's yeah. fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for kind of um, getting through. We've got a little bit of a party going on outside at the moment. There's quite a bit of a distracting noise, but yeah. I appreciate you being focused and, yeah. and sharing with us. And yeah. there's so much more I could ask you, but I really, yeah, that has been really helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Deborah.